Somebody tell me what what uh, structures we were talking about. Lance Holy Footprints. That's right. Here is the deal. Leaky had already dated the Ash. She's stuck with a date that she can't go back on. She's now got footprints that are obviously human. I mean, you know, basically she can't get around it. But she cannot say they're human or else it would throw the whole evolutionary timeline into a major snafu. A guy named Russell Tuttle was invited to examine them because Tuttle is a world expert on uh, people who walk around without shoes on. Uh, people who are habitually unshod. He says a pair of homo sapiens could have made them. And in the several more logical features, the feet of the individuals that made the trails are indistinguishable from those of modern humans. He goes on to say, if the land's holy footprints were not known to be so old, we would readily conclude that they were made by a member of our genus homo. Somebody tell me in modern language, what's he saying? We would say it's human, but we've already dated this stuff. <laughs> exactly. And we, we would call these modern footprints, but we've already stuck a date on them where modern humans couldn't be there. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Rod Card. He said, make no mistake about it. They are like modern, or this is actually Donald Johansson. He said, they are like modern footprints. If one were left in the sand of a California beach today, and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell it from a hundred other prints on the beach, nor would you. Rod Carr said, the land's holy footprints were, for all practical purposes, that of a modern human foot. The indentations, the shape, the distribution of the toes, the relationship between the marks that left by the heel and the ball of the foot all show that the individuals who walked that way had acquired the fully upright gait, two-legged gait, used by modern humans today. So we go back to our, our thing for just a moment. Here's the problem. Uh, you see my little arrow that I'm moving around? Her footprints that she found would actually be way down here. And they're exactly like modern man. So how in the world do you explain modern man being way down here when you still got all these other alleged links before us? You'd have to discredit the dating. You'd have to either discredit the dating or discredit the others. So what they've done basically is they've hidden that land's holy footprints. They don't put them in textbooks. They've basically thrown them out as any kind of an archaeological find. The next one on our list is Homo habilis. Homo habilis meaning the uh, working man or man that works with tools. This one was discovered by Louis Leakey in 1961 at the Old Old Gorge. There you see he and the uh, a particular skull. You'll notice the skull is in parentheses. It says K and M 1490 1470. That is simply, they give the initials to the Kenya National Museum and then the specimen number. So a lot of times you'll actually, in atheistic websites, you'll see people refer to things as, you'll, they'll say, you know, well, the, the K&M 1470 skulls does blah, blah, blah. Or they may even shorten it to 1470. But that's, that's what they're talking about. There's an image of what Mr. Havilah supposedly looks like. And before we deal with him, I want us to talk just for a second on how we get the images. This guy right here is called Zingianthropus robustus or Australopithecus boisei. If you look at the skull on the right, hopefully you notice how big this thing's mandible was. He got a huge, he earned the nickname Nutcracker Man. Hopefully you can understand why. 
they thought that this guy would put a knife between his teeth and just crack it literally with his bare teeth. Here is an artist's depiction of what he allegedly looks like. Now, here's the neat part. They gave that skull, if I back up one, they gave that to three independent artists. And you'll notice at the bottom, hopefully you can make out a little bit, there are three different pictures there. Guys, they look nothing alike. Letting you know that a lot of this stuff is left up to artist interpretation. You've got one that's got a very ape-like look. you got one that looks like uh, Planet of the Apes. And you got one that looks like somebody that works in the New York subway system. <laughs> we get back to Homo habilis for just a minute. These are the bones of Homo habilis. And again, you notice the, the paucity of them. There's not many, are there? You got a few long bones of the arm. The bone down here at the bottom, this guy is a heart palate of the mouth. But from that, we get this family right here. Lots and lots of speculation. Notice they put one of them in the trees. They've got the others upright walking. Trying to sell this image that this is the guy who walked, who climbed down out of the trees, began walking, began using tools. We're going to come back to Homo habilis just a little bit in a minute. Homo erectus would be the, the one allegedly very, very close to us. Homo erectus stands for the upright and walking man. There allegedly is what Mr. Homo erectus looks like. Ernest Meyer said the Homo erectus stage is characterized by a body skeleton, which, so far as we know, does not differ from that of modern, modern man in any essential point. Homo erectus, found throughout the old world during much of the Middle Pleistocene, is barely distinguishable taxonomically from Homo sapiens. What are these two guys saying? Same. That's, that, that's us, almost. Yeah. Basically, if you find a homo sapien bone and you find a homo erectus bone, they're, the, they're exactly alike. You're not going to see any difference. Here is a point that should not be missed. Mary Leakey discovered the remains of a circular stone hut at the bottom of bed one at the Old, old Divide Gorge beneath fossils of Homo habilis. Now guys, a circular stone hut means somebody was smart enough to build lodging. Evolutionists have long attributed the deliberate manufacture of shelter only to Homo sapiens. Yet Dr. Leakey discovered Australopithecus and Homo habilis together with manufactured housing. So if we look at our picture, you've got housing down here. So how do I, as a scientist and a teacher and a Christian, look at this whole tree? The ones that have three arrows beside them, all of those, everybody pretty much readily admits those are monkeys. you got Artipithecus rhamnus cadaba that you've got a toe bone ten, ten miles away. That's a monkey. you got Kenyanthropus platyops, platyops, which was basically smashed bones taken from five different locations over much, many, many years. Ape. Lucy, we've already talked about the fact she was very much like an ape. I even showed you some evidence for that. All of the ones that you see with arrows there, that's ape, 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 ape. And then the top three are variations, basically, of humans. I mean, you've got circular stone hut below Homo habilis. What does the fossil record really show? Jeremy Rifkin put it best. He said, what the record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force the various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions, all to no avail. He says, today, the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution.
All right. Let me unplug for a minute. So that's one way that we can look at the, the whole overall situation. We can kind of set up a, a family tree. We start out at the very bottom of what they allegedly throw out as 28 million years old, and we work our way up. Um, and, you know, hopefully you guys could see from that, realistically, they don't have a huge amount to go on. Another way to do, to look at this whole thing, is to start showing people the errors, some of the, the known errors of dating system, which we're going to look at that as well. Comments, thoughts so far? It's pretty yeah. pathetic. Oh, I'm just going to cover it again. <laughs> um, which one uh, has the, uh, has one, one foot bone like a uh, hundred thousand years apart from, from the rest of the structure? That was Artipith that was Artipithecus Romulus Cadaver. Okay. It had a single toe bone that was dated hundreds of thousands of years different from the other bones in that collection. Okay. Um, you want me to put that slide up? <clears throat> I can put the slide up if that will help. Oh, no. Um, I was just wondering um, if, if that leaves any room for, for, um, uh, for change or for growth within a species under their understanding um, uh, within 100,000 years, uh, if that makes any sense. Well, think about this. How old, what's the oldest population of people we know today? We, w we might say the Chinese, but even then you're, you're getting at a, a four to five, thousand years old their culture you're talking about hundred thousand so why in the world would you put anything that belongs here's the uh, there's the slide why would you put anything that is several uh, using their words separated in time by several hundred thousand years I mean, I see what you're saying. Could is it possible that this thing, you know, fits in their parameters, but maybe it's just several thousand years, several hundred thousand years different? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I'm saying that that it kind of. Uh, 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 I don't know what I'm saying now. Uh, <laughs> it, it it just seems like it doesn't leave any room for for growth in a species. If they're trying to complete this this column, oh, uh, well, I see what you say. Like in other words, has there been no evolution for several right. hundred thousand years? Right, or several yeah. hundred thousand years. Yeah. <clears throat> Other thoughts? You guys have seen these. I'm not going to spend much time on them, but I at least want you to be very aware of the fact that. There are textbooks that are teaching very blatantly that we come from apes, that we evolved from. Uh, this one says you're an animal, you share common heritage with earthworms. Humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than 4 billion years ago. And they give these pictures of what we call evolutionary trees of life with these beautiful lines already drawn like we know that that's all there that that's filled in, it's documented, it's a scientific fact, there is no question, when the reality of it is, those lines are imaginary. Nobody in the world has ever seen a, uh, for instance, a protist lined up to become a flatworm. How do you get one of those? Can we do it in a lab? The answer is no. We've never seen anything like that. We've never seen a round worm evolve into an annelid, a mollusk, an arthropod, any of this stuff. But they've got their pretty little pictures to sell the story. I asked the question, why does it matter? And I think this is a question that we as preachers need to kind of 
keep in the forefront of our minds when we're teaching people, whether it be a group of, of high school seniors or whether it be a group of senior citizens, they need to understand that what we're discussing today is very pertinent to their lives. It matters because, as we talked about before, the foundations of the creation account are being compromised, and if there was no creator, ultimately there was no savior. I want you to try your best to remember this slide right here. Uh, I often tell people, you know, we know we have two divisions of the Bible, Old and New Testament. If you think about putting a third division in your Bible in Genesis chapter 3, that will help you with the mental picture that I'm trying to communicate to you today. And that is, prior to Genesis 3, man was basically in this covenant relationship with God. In Genesis 3, that was ruined through sin. We are separated from God. The entire rest of the Bible is trying to tell us how to get back into that relationship. Ultimately, through Jesus Christ. If you take out those opening chapters of Genesis and you say that we evolved from some ape-like creature, then you've basically undone the whole scheme of redemption. You know, you've got Genesis 3.15, the very first messianic prophecy, where God is telling the serpent, he says, I'll put enmity between thee and woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Thou shall bruise his heel. God's saying, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to bruise his heel, but ultimately he's going to crush your head. Well, folks, if that didn't happen, did we even need a Savior to begin with? Because ultimately, if evolution is true, Genesis is a myth, and in the beginning there was nothing but dirt. That's why this matters. A lot of times I have people ask me, Brad, do you think that, you know, Genesis account of creation, do you think that that is a uh, salvation issue? I'm one of these weird people that thinks all the Bible's a salvation issue. Because all of it is inspired of God. This is the way that evolution is presented to our kids. And that's, you know, basically a an amoeba to man presentation. And yet, the Bible was teaching that we were the pinnacle of God's creation. That man was literally made from the dust of the ground, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then through sin, we fell. Two totally different pictures. How would you describe, if I were to ask you a test question to say, describe the differences between man described in the Bible versus man described by evolutionary means? What are some differences? Uh, in the Bible, man was made instantly. Okay. As opposed to having animal descendants. All right. What about things like intelligence? Man was able to 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 name these animals. Okay. So he had intelligence. What about communication? <clears throat> Could he communicate with God? Yes. Okay. So the biblical picture shows a an intelligent being that is able to communicate, that is able, that is instantly created. Whereas evolution is teaching that we came up out of sludge, and over millions of years we finally got intelligence, crawled down out of the trees, and learned to walk. Those are two totally different pictures, guys. And we got to be able to communicate that to people. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the other side of how we can teach people that these missing links are wrong. We've already gone through a few of these. 
I'm going to call this my, my hall of shame. These would be the missing links that evolutionists don't necessarily want us to know about. You got Java Man. We ask the question, where's the evidence? In other words, are there any apes or humans today with the features that they are portraying? Java Man, we found a tooth in 1890. We found a, a skull a month later. A year later, we found a thigh bone. And a few months after that, we found another tooth. So two teeth, a thigh bone, and a skull cap. The teeth and the thigh bone were very much human. But the skull cap belonged to a giant gibbon monkey. Now, in order for you to understand just how much of a fight we're in in the whole creation versus evolution controversy, the guy who dug up all of these bones, while he's down there digging, he came across two other skulls. But they were remarkably modern looking. He realized these look like modern humans. And he realized you can't have modern man living at the same time that you've got an alleged missing link, that you have Java man. So guess what he did with the modern skulls? He hid them under the floorboards of his house for 26 years. What about this guy? We talked a little bit already about Lucy. We'll skip Lucy. Uh, Nebraska Man. This one's my favorite. Nebraska Man was actually introduced, going to be used as evidence in the Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. It was also printed in a picture in, uh, there's the picture, in the Illustrated London News in 1922. Again, we ask the question, all right, where is the evidence for Nebraska man? All of it hinges around a single tooth. Now, the sad part is not, if you look on the screen, you see this picture that was put into a newspaper. You got a man and his wife, and it looks like she might be cooking or something. I don't know. The sad part is not necessarily that you got this guy and his wife that are made up, fabricated, literally fabricated from a tooth. The sad part is we later learned that tooth belonged to this right here. <laughs> here's, how they, here's how they get away with it, guys. Watch the screen for just a moment. This is a uh, uh, homo erectus skull. Now, you look at at that skull and you think, well, that's what they found. Actually, that's roughly between 60 and 80 bone fragments that have all been glued together, taken from several different locations. So you got a composite there. Now that composite does not look good enough to convince anybody. So they ask a, a scientific illustrator to come in and make a cast. And he does, and that's what it looks like, and that's a whole lot better. That you can sell to a museum. In fact, that you can put in a textbook. They invite the scientific illustrator to come back and to flesh this guy out a little bit. Because after all, we want to know what he looked like. What, what were some features? What can we put in a textbook? So they slap muscles on him, they put a layer of skin on him, and lo and behold, guys, we've gone from roughly 60 to 80 bone fragments taken from five different locations to having a picture of a guy that looks like you went out back and took his picture. So you see this picture here. That's what it came from. And yet the picture that you're looking at right now came from five different locations. It's basically the same as what we might call Hollywood magic. Next guy on our hall of shame is Piltdown Man. This would be, you know how sometimes uh, families families have a, a crazy aunt that they want to keep in the closet and not tell anybody about? 
This would be evolution's crazy ant that they don't want to tell anybody about. Piltdown Man came, as far as the evidence, came from a gravel pit in Piltdown, England. We asked the question, where's the evidence? They found in roughly early 1900 some bone fragments of a skull and the jawbone that you see on the screen right here. They, they glued them all together. The only problem was 40 years later. Now, 40 years in science times means it's already been published. It has already received scientific name. It has already gone into textbooks. It has already been taught to at least three or four generations. Forty years later, they found out that this thing was a hoax. What they had done was they had taken a modern human skull fragments, glued them together. They took the jawbone of an orangutan. They filed down the back teeth of that orangutan to make them look more human. They glued the whole thing together, dipped it in acid purposefully to age it. And then they presented it to the world and said, here's your missing ancestor. And for 40 years, folks, people bought it. And in fact, I am pretty confident that probably some of your grandparents learned about this creature as being a missing link. Next one for our Hall of Shame, Orc Man. You see a single bone right here, right that green area? This is the back of the skull. So if you put your hand back on the back of your skull, some of you got a little knot back there. That's kind of in this region. It's the it's where the occipital bones, the parietal bones come together. We ask, we say, okay, where's the evidence that this really is a missing link? Because if we're going to put it in textbooks and we're going to put it in Time Magazine and we're going to make a big deal about it, surely we've got evidence. But again, I would point out the only evidence they've got is a single bone. If you look at the bottom picture down here, you'll notice that cast is very small. You see the hand, and that gave them some problems for the longest time until 1982 they decided that maybe this was a child. That the bone fragment itself belonged to a, a child. So 1982 they announced the fragment belonged to a human child. Some overeager scientists reconstructed an entire human. They said it was the oldest human fossil ever discovered in Europe. And yet, years later, we found out that piece of bone belonged to a six-month-old donkey. Again, guys, all of this stuff, you got to realize, when they make a declaration, the fanfare is, is like you wouldn't believe. The banners are unfurled. The media jumps on it. It's a big deal. And then lo and behold, when they find out the truth years later, you know what? There's not as much of a big deal. They don't come back in those textbooks and put a big disclaimer saying, hey, by the way, we got this wrong. They just very quietly drop it from the textbooks. What about Neanderthal man? Most of you probably heard about Neanderthal man. There you see a, a fossil depiction. Probably the best known of all the alleged missing links. What most of you don't know is that in 1958, a gentleman by the name of Dr. A.J. Cave examined the original Neander Valley fossils, and he proved that it was nothing more than a man who had suffered from advanced stages of arthritis. Now ask yourself this question, does arthritis cause bone changes? Yes. Absolutely. This is a book called uh, Buried Alive, it's by Jack Cousseau. 
He examined the Neanderthal fossils. Look at what he says. He said, you must understand this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromalga, or the excess secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. What are you saying, Jack? I'm saying this bone is not some kind of missing link. It's a diseased human being. In fact, let me go, let me get out of here for just a second. Let's go back to something we looked at a minute ago. You guys remember this picture? If you look right up here, you get into Neander Valley, Germany. This region where the arrow is, let me get it back. That's where the Neanderthal fossils have been found. Why is that significant? That's in an area that doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. Now think about that for just a moment. You've got creatures, humans living up there that may have problems making sufficient amounts of vitamin D. They're not going to be able to absorb calcium. Would we expect to find fossils in that area of creatures that maybe have a thicker brow or that maybe have bone malformations? Absolutely. And that's exactly what we find. Comments, thoughts, questions. All right, one more. Go ahead. I've got one that takes you all the way back to the beginning of class, so I thought I'd wait to the end. <laughs> no, that's okay. Go ahead. The, we started talking about heterozygous traits. Does that affect yes. anything? Does that affect anything other than skin color or? Blood type, I'm, I'm specifically asking, you know, are physical features determined by that also? You know, for instance, the, oriental, ra the oriental races with the, the slit eyes and that kind of thing. Would that also Okay, good, yeah. What about, what about, well, first off, let me answer your question. Yes, heterozygous can affect all kinds of genetic traits. Uh, if you have a mixture of stuff, it is going to affect the look or the, the, what you end up with. Um, it can affect things like hair color, or eye color, or whether or not maybe you're prone to get heart disease or whatever. You mentioned, um, the oriental folks, the eyes, the almond shaped eyes. Uh, let's, let's deal with two of them at once. We've got oriental people that have almond-shaped eyes, a very distinct characteristic. We also have uh, colored people that have very, usually very curly, tight, kind of curly, kinky hair. How do we explain those? Well, the eye thing we can explain as simply a, it's a, actually a double layer of fat on their upper lid that is causing their eyes to take on that almond-shaped appearance. I've read a lot of different research on it. Basically, the, the thought is what happened is a group of people left the Tower of Babel, traveled through Asia. They get over to the area that we call China, Orient. Somewhere in that, one of the family members had a mutation, which is not... You know, mutation does not mean you have evolution. It's simply you have a, a mutation in your DNA. A mutation that allowed for a double layer of fat to be placed on that upper eyelid. That was not a negative mutation. In fact, in those areas where there's a lot of blinding snow, it would have been seen as a, a probably beneficial mutation. That is a dominant trait. The reason we know it's a dominant trait, if you have a, an Oriental person and a, uh, say, a Caucasian person, and they get married, their children are going to be more likely to have almond-shaped eyes. That is a dominant trait. It, once it gets into that populace, once it gets into that population, it is going to be 
the, the primary basis of that population. They were isolated thanks to the mountain range for many, 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 many centuries. Then they were isolated for political reasons for many, many, many centuries. They were inbreeding with each other. So you got a population of all almond-shaped eyes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Do I understand it? Sure. We then look at the, the hair structure on people who are uh, whatever you want to call them. These days, and please understand, guys, I, I say this in jest not as disrespectful, but just because it, it's frustrating trying to keep up now whether I'm to call somebody a, a black person or an African-American person or a European-American person or a whatever. People with dark skin oftentimes have curly hair. So how do we explain that? Again, we go back to the Tower of Babel. We move down to Swahili, like we were talking about. In that environment, which one is more beneficial? Hair like mine or hair like ducks? Open mine. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know why? Because my hair lays flat on my head, and it gets very oily or greasy by the end of the day. That... That allows my, basically it, cause, it would cause my head to heat up a lot more than yours. Your hair is a lot kinkier, allowing air to pass through it a lot easier. So if we're in a hot region around the equator near the sun, does it make sense that you're going to want to have hair that is not acting like an insulator? Absolutely. So after several generations, you've got dark skinned people who have hair that is kinky, curly, has the ability for air to pass through it easier than greasy, flat hair. Does it make sense that that's what the population is eventually going towards? Absolutely. And then eventually it's going to get like Jerry's and you won't have to worry about the wind blowing through it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist that one. I, I, I could have said something about Dean, but he wasn't here, so I, I, had, I had to throw you under the bus on that one. <laughs> All right, what about Flipper Man? This guy was a single collarbone, found in the Libyan Desert in 1979. Fossil was dated based on estimate of fossil marine plankton nearby. Now let's stop right there for just a minute. So they found a collarbone. How did they date that collarbone? They looked at some marine plankton nearby that they estimated to be 5 million years old. So guess how old they then labeled the collarbone? 5 million years. Guys, that is, first off, I hope you can see how how many assumptions are being made, but I also hope you can see that that's circular reasoning. They're dating layers by the bones they find in them, then they turn right around and date bones by the layer that they're discovered in. It's, it's circular. So they got this collarbone. They're saying, hey, this thing's five million years old. This is older than Lucy. They march it into a, a science conference and declare that they've got one of the oldest upright walking the only problem is a guy in the conference named Tim White, another fellow scientist, he looks at the facets on this bone. He said, first off, that's not a collarbone. That's a rib bone. To which, as you can imagine, you know, most scientists are going to look at that and say, okay, well, then, then we got a five million year old rib bone here. And he says, no, no, that's not the rib bone of a human. That's the rib bone of a dolphin. Point being, this wasn't a missing link at all. It was basically some over-eager scientists who were really, really hungry to try to find anything they could and paint it as, out as being a, an alleged missing link. Somebody, who's got your Bibles with you? Hey, Brad, real quick. Sure. You said that was back in the, the Libyan desert it was found? Yes. So they probably went and threw it away real quick so that uh, the flood wasn't proven on that one, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, there actually have been some of these alleged missing links that have 
quote unquote disappeared when they fall into question. The most famous disappearance is Peking Man. It's it started falling under some scrutiny. And lo and behold, the fossils just disappeared completely. Nobody can find them anymore. But, yeah, you're right. Somebody read me Genesis chapter 1, starting in about verse 20, all the way through the end of that chapter. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind, and every wind burned bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind. And everything that creeps on the ground after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has yielded seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw that all he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay. A couple of things I want to point out. Number one, we were the last things created. He had already created everything else. He had prepared this earth for us. He had spent roughly five and a half days preparing the perfect environment for his beloved creation. He gave us plants, he gave us water, he gave us animals, he gave us fish, he gave us birds. And then finally, when everything is in place, he brings us into the picture. It says, notice in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Notice that that is plural. Us, our, and our are plural. What is the implication there? Right there. That the Godhead was basically having a conference. I mean, think about it for just a moment. That didn't happen with the birds, the fish, and the creeping things. You've got a plurality discussing the creation of man. Also, by the way, just reinforces the fact that God, Jesus, Holy Spirit were all present. But it says that, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. If you had to preach a mini-sermon on what it meant to be made in the image of God, how, what would you do? What would you say? Well, de definitely spirit beings. Okay. Why do you say that? Because the Bible says that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Okay. So, so what part of us is made in the image and likeness of God? Our spirit. spirit. Our spirit. Absolutely. So when somebody says we're made in the image and likeness of God, another way of looking at that is we are made with a spirit like God, unlike all the other creation. Now, I don't mean to be the one to break your heart today, but... Fido doesn't have a spirit, and Fluffy the cat ain't going to heaven. <laughs> now let's let's keep going while we're here.
So this is day six. Flip, flip in your Bible to Genesis 2. And let's see. Somebody start reading. Somebody read me, I guess, verse 4 to 7 first. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and heaven. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to arise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Okay. Now, in this particular portion, we're getting more of a... to God. Genesis chapter 1, it simply says we were made in his image and likeness, that God made us. Suddenly, God kind of peels back a, a layer of the onion or the curtain and shows us a little bit more how it was actually done. So we're formed of the dust of the ground and that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That, don't miss the importance of that. The fact that mankind, that we have never, ever, ever, ever been able to create living material from non-living material. Number one, God did it. Number two, life has not ceased since he did it. Because if life were to cease, it would not get restarted. It takes life to make life. So the lineage of humanity has been constant and has been a seamless thread from this verse right here. God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. Lo and behold, we are a part of that, that thread that started in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. All right, now somebody keep picking up and read, starting about verse... Oh, uh, let's see. Verse 20 to 25. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place, or at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which... He had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. Now we got even a little bit more of the, the curtain peeled back. So we see God fashioning man from the dust of the ground, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. He parades the animals in front of Adam. Adam names them, but you guys can imagine, Adam is looking around, realizing, I'm not like any of these. Yes, God, these are nice. Yes, God, these are, are, are amazing creations. You know, I'm so very thankful to be here, but... I, I'm missing something. So he creates a help meet. Now, oftentimes we, we say that word together as an help meet. Actually, it is a help that is meet for him or suitable for him. What does that mean for a woman to be the help meet of a man? Specifically for him. Okay. Perform those tests that, that the man um, um, uh, maybe can't in his duties. Okay. Let's let's just go ahead and uh, 
jump right in and land the plane and, and talk about something that isn't talked about much in the church anymore, unfortunately. What are our roles? What is a man's role and what is a woman's role? Man is supposed to lead his family. Okay. Leader. What does that entail? Oh, well, and I'm, the, the reason I'm pressing you on that, it, you're 100% right, and, and you guys know me enough now to know I agree, but I also know that sometimes that's a pat answer that we give in the church. I want to make sure we know what that really means. What does it mean that we're to be the leaders? That we provide both, uh, I would say, spiritually and physically for the family. Uh, okay. And while the wife might serve as a, a while not an inferior role, but a different role to, to help the man in that regard uh, when it comes okay. to raising up the children or keeping up the home or whatever it is. The New Testament gets more specific uh, than Genesis does, obviously, but... Uh, uh, you know, everything, the man is accountable for everything, I believe. Okay. But uh, the woman was created to help him uh, reach the goals that God has set for the family. Okay. Absolutely. Up. Let's let's go on and let's dive a little deeper then. What is Titus 2, how does it lay out more of the picture of a woman's role? Titus chapter 2, somebody start reading. Uh, let's see. Somebody start reading. Actually, just read verses 1 through 5. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Okay. What somebody tell me what the what the what the passage is saying right there. Keeping in mind all we're doing, guys, is we're going from the very creation of woman. Adam looking around saying, Hey, there's there's not something here for me. So God creates a help that is suitable for him. Now we flip over to the New Testament and we start learning what that suitable help is supposed to be doing. And that is, it says, the older women are to teach the younger women that they're to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good, obedient to their husbands. Notice this, I've never in the history of my being a Christian heard a preacher discuss the fact that that this is equal to blaspheming the word of God. And yet that's what the text says. The text says at the end of this that the word of God may not be blasphemed. The point being, I think in the church we dance around this topic a lot. And we kind of skirt, we, we hint at what we're supposed to be doing and what men are supposed to be doing and what women are supposed to be doing. But nobody ever lands a plane and says, look, if you violate this, ultimately you are blaspheming the word of God. And yet that's what the writer says here. Jerry, you look perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what, you, what you're saying or what 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 you're saying. Okay. I am saying that I believe God created woman for a purpose. Would you agree that that's true? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I am saying, furthermore, that we have been given biblical instruction of what those purposes are. And I think part of that is to be homemakers, to love children, 
to love husband, to be obedient to their husbands, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you've got a Titus 2 passage that is basically laying out what it means to be a virtuous woman. Right. Do we hear that preached from the pulpit very much? No. Well, let, let, I mean, and guys, please understand, I'm not casting judgment on y'all's personal situations because, quite frankly, I don't know your situations. But do we hear preachers admonishing wives to be homemakers and admonishing young teenage girls to make that their goal in life? No. No. In fact, guys, if you really think about the system that we have created, in the church, and I, I'm not trying to tear down Christian colleges, but I would question why Why do we have Christian colleges that are, are trying to get women into professional careers that take loads and loads of education, loads and loads of money to pay for that education, if their end goal is to truly be mothers and homemakers? It's a, it basically, Gary, it's a paradigm shift that is outside the normal reins of thinking because the church is strayed so close to what society is doing. Right. And that's, that's where I hope we can get, I think we need to get back to what God's original plan was. So are you saying we shouldn't, uh... <laughs> yeah. well, see, because... When Just let the Bible minute. speak where the Bible well, speaks. Well, you know, we go to Acts 18 also. And, uh, okay. But Priscilla wasn't. She seemed to be a tent maker just like Aquila. Okay. So we have to, Deborah, Deborah had a job. She may not have been married. So what we have to really do and truly do is say, okay, is this all the Bible says for women to do? And this is what I'm going to tell my daughters to do? See, when you bring it home, then you make it real. Right, it's absolutely. A bit, it's for you guys to do, but then I make you something else. Right, um, right. So you know, we got to bring it home to our doorstep and say, "Well, is this what I'm gonna have my daughter to do?" And this is—is is this all the Bible says my daughter to do? To be a home. What daughter. is? How, how do we define a virtuous woman? See, I think in the church yeah, for far too. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I think, I think in the church for far too long we have, we have equated. Secular success as success. And that is not true, folks. I don't care. You know, you can tell me about your kids being lawyers and doctors and, and having big houses and driving fancy cars, and that's nice and all. But I want to know, are they going to make it to heaven? Yeah, that's most important. I agree, 100%. And I think the Bible has laid out a prescription of how to get families to heaven. And that prescription is... We got to have a, a dad who is a spiritual leader. I agree. Who cares for the spiritual welfare, the financial welfare, the emotional welfare of his family. And we have to have a help suitable to him who is then able to be a, a homemaker, who is to love his husband, to love her children, and to prepare that home for the family. And to be a virtuous woman. I and I, I think, I really honestly believe part of the reason we're having trouble in our society is we have gone so far from that. You know, in my generation, we had latchkey kids. And you guys know what a latchkey kid is. Some of you may have been a latchkey kid. You come home, both parents are at work, you let yourself in to your house, and you are home alone from usually 3.30 until 5 or 5.30. And in my day, you played Atari or you went outside and you played football. Well, the same thing is basically happening today, except today we've technologic, we've tech, technized it a little bit where we've got daycare centers where you can drop your kids off at 6 in the morning and pick them up at 6 or 7 in the evening. Or maybe we've got some other kind of a workaround system. My point is we got to get back to a biblical plan for the home. Yeah. I think sometimes in saying that, that women are to be uh, <coughs> uh, help needs and homemakers, 
we kind of implied that, that they can't do anything outside of the home. And I think that's a danger. Um, and I think that's kind of how it comes <coughs> off sometimes. And, and that's why we kind of shy away from it, because of the way that, that, that terms are perceived by the world. Right. Bi okay. Biblically speaking, can I say it is wrong for a woman to hold a job? Absolutely not. There's not a Bible verse in, in there where I could point to to say a woman cannot hold a job. But can I also say her first and primary job must be the home? Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. And can I... Can I just as, as strongly say, if a woman is away from her home for 50 or 60 hours a week, she is probably not doing her primary job. Is that not a fair statement? It gets a little more arbitrary there, but I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I agree. Anything that, that keeps the, the wife or the woman... From her primary goal that God has set for her, and that's the home, then it becomes yeah. sinful. Um, now that might depend on which woman and how many kids you have and what kind of husband you Absolutely. have, and it gets really, uh, you know. Absolutely. Different. Right, and and all, I think all of us know. In it, you know, for instance, somebody says, "Well, I've got uh, two teenage children. They're in school, and when they went back to school, I decided to go back to work, and so she is working part time from." Nine to three every day, and she's at home when they get home. Is there a problem with that? Is she still able to be a homemaker? Yeah. Is she still able to tend and mold and, and train up her children? Yeah. Can I, as a preacher or a dad or whatever, say that's absolutely wrong? No, I can't. But if somebody says, you know, I'm going to be a, you name the whatever, I'm going to be an ex, and I'm going to work 50, 60 hours a week. At whose detriment? Because ultimately something has to give. And what's giving in that case is going to be the home. Communist question. I know this is a controversial topic. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> John. There's a possibility that, you know, a woman takes on a job or, or two children are moved on to they're older teen years, and, uh, you know, like we said, we haven't uh, said that's a wrong thing to do. But if it's uh, contrary to what her husband wishes for her, then there's a, she's not subjecting herself to the husband. Sure. And also, sure. uh, that's not honoring, honoring God, in, in my opinion. True. I, I guess, guys, one of the things that I want to prepare you for, you know, I, I travel every single weekend. This coming weekend, I'll be in Texas. Travel every single weekend to churches all over the United States. And, and part of what I hope to be able to do as I'm teaching you all about things like Christian evidence is it's also teach you about real life out in the field, so to speak, with, the, with what's going on in the church. What you will run into, period, is the fact that people of my generation and the generation below me and the one probably right above me, 90% of them have two income families. And, and we can discuss whether or not that's right or wrong and, and blah, blah, blah. But it's a fact that they are two income families and that most all of them have developed a lifestyle that is now dependent on two incomes. Meaning we, we've got, we're, we're living a certain way that we've got to have money from mom and dad's income or else we're going to be in trouble. You all are, are teachers and preachers of the gospel, and I, I think one of the things that I would strongly suggest you do is plant the seeds of what God originally wanted and how to get back to a home that is most nourishing for the entire family. Because I don't, I don't know that anybody in the world could argue with me that two parents being away a lot is going to help get kids to heaven. I don't think we can argue that. <laughs> Other thoughts, comments, questions?
<laughs> Jerry's looking at me like he he's either he's either gonna strike out and hit me or cry or something. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, just thinking. I agree. The family suffers. It's just like James says. It's just not as easy as it used to be to to nail it down. You know, particularly when people are already doing these and they're defended unless they seriously cut back. So it's 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 a tough one. All right, let, let, let's do a little paradigm shift for just a minute, Jerry. Let's say you've got a church of 100 people. Yeah. Uh, 100, 100 families. We'll make it 100 families. So you got a church of 100 families. 80 of those families have two incomes, and they're constantly on the go, and everything is just wide open, going Mach 9. Parents get home just in time to, to have a quick meal. And basically, they have got the hours from 6 to 9 with their kids each night. Okay? And I th understand, this is fairly real. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's say that you preach to that congregation for three years, and you try your very best to teach them the importance of getting their kids to heaven. And you lay out, what is a father's role? Because I'm not, right now we're focusing just on the women, and guys, you got to understand, the bulk of the stuff is on our shoulders. Right. So, but let's say you, you preach three years, a series, you know, over and over. Guys, here's what your role is. Ladies, here's what your role is. Children, here's what your role is. And so at the end of three years, you now have 50% of your congregation, you've got full-time homemakers who are actively teaching their kids Bible at home. Do you think that is a improvement in your congregation? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think that's where we've got to mentally get back in the church. Uh, you know, we've got a massive rate of kids leaving the church, and I think part of it is because we aren't doing anything in the home anymore. We assume that church, i.e. the building and the preacher and the, the youth minister, are going to do it for us, and that's not the case. I was just going to say, I, I think that's the best way to do it. That's why uh, my wife homeschools and, and she doesn't work or anything like that. Uh, but what I've also seen this lead to sometimes is, I wouldn't call it extremism, but I would call those people who um, who are in that situation where the wife doesn't have to work and can homeschool, where they're suddenly a little more regarding themselves as more holy or more Christian-like opposed to maybe the family. I mean, have you seen that before where the family, yeah. the wife has to work? and they go to public school, well, maybe they're not as sanctified as we are because we're more devout. Right. And I, right. I absolutely hate that distinction. Well, and I think, that again, as a preacher, we have the responsibility to understand you're going to have people in all situations. Mm -hmm. That's right. You're going to have a single mom who, for whatever reason, she may have been put in a position where she has to work. Her husband may have walked out on her, left her with three kids, and she doesn't have the family safety net around her, and suddenly she's finding herself as not only the mom, but also kind of the dad in her family. Yeah. Um, I don't draw lines of judgment about it. I do know what I think the Bible is teaching, and I do know what I think is best for family units. And I think if we're ever going to truly change what's going on in the church today, and that is a massive rate of, of kids leaving and a very shallow basis of, of religious knowledge, biblical knowledge, it's going to have to take place in the house. It is not going to take place in a church building. Because even if we make y'all the greatest preachers since whoever, you still only get them an hour a week, maybe two. It's got to be something else, and that's got to be at home. Yes, sir. I think if we're going to have any effect on changing this role, we've got to go perhaps a step further back and teach people truly what their needs are versus their wants. We've got people going out buying stuff they don't need with money that they do not have, and then they have to work two jobs. And you know, It's called keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> it's amazing how much... People buy that they don't need, and then with money yeah. that they don't have to buy it with. Yeah. Uh, and, and there again, if you look at my generation and the generations around us, 
uh, guys, I distinctly remember when I got married, and this, this is to my fault. When I got married, I expected to have all the stuff my parents had. And by that I mean I expected to have a washer and dryer. I expected to have a dining room table. I expected to have furniture in my house and cars out back and clothes in my closet. Not realizing that it had taken my family, my parents, 25 years to amass all the stuff that they had. And so, being in my generation like most of us did, we went out and bought it on credit. And, you know, you think about it for just a moment. How many young people start their lives off basically with one foot in a hole simply because they're wanting to keep up with the Joneses? But this goes back to the importance of a preacher who's willing to get up in a pulpit and say, young ladies, y'all 12, 13, 14-year-olds, I hope and I pray that you will strive to be the best homemaker you can be so that they're mentally thinking about, you know what? I'm to be a homemaker. I'm not necessarily to go out there and, and make a lot of money so that we can live in a certain neighborhood in Colorado. Yes, sir, in the back. The silent one speaks. Yeah. <laughs> you, you brought up a, a point that, that I have a real question about. How do you effectively deal with a young woman with a two-year-old child whose husband just walked out on her. How, how do you deal with that and, and try to teach her how to live? Okay. <clears throat> First and foremost, she's got to, to think about her own soul. And she's got to make sure she is living her life in such a way that she can get to heaven. She's then immediately got to think about her child's soul. And getting her child to heaven. Once she has, has kind of gotten the shock of, okay, I'm in this alone, husband's gone, then she needs to start amassing, what resources do I have? Do I have parents that can help some? Do I have a church family that can help some? What, what resources do I have that can, number one, help me keep my soul in a proper perspective and be able to get to heaven and help me get my child to heaven. And, you know, would they, are they going to have to think outside the box on occasion? Absolutely. Um, I dare say, and I don't know what situation you're talking about, but I dare say if there was a, a blip in the Bear Valley Bulletin that said something like, Christian sister needs help twice a week with a, a you know child doing X, Y, Z, I would say that particular position would be filled within by the end of that day by people who would be able to help either child care, watching the child, helping her get a job, whatever it is, uh, kind of as a safety net. But she's got to understand that first and foremost, all of her priorities have got to change to be God and soul getting to heaven. It's not about where she lives or what kind of car she drives or, or whether or not she's got satellite TV. It's got to be about how can I position myself best to get myself and my kid to heaven. Yeah, John. That's where the world has uh, failed women terribly and that uh, the world would be saying, you don't need to be asking for help from mom and dad. You don't need to no, be asking absolutely. help from your church. You need to do yep. this all on your own. You're independent. You'll, you'll do just fine. Get out yep. there and work if it takes one, two, three jobs, whatever it is. Put your child wherever they need to be, just so that you can, right. you know, maintain. First of all, maybe your uh, your lifestyle, or to achieve the lifestyle you're still dreaming of. Or, uh, it, it, it's just so corrupt. Feminism, feminism has really done a lot of damage to the church. And even though we don't talk about it and preach about it and, and discuss it much. You know, the fact of the matter is, it really has hurt the church. Wow! <laughs> Guys, uh, we, we'll pick up a little bit there. I, I do hope, though, you don't miss the overall message, and that is the importance of comprehending that we were made in the image and likeness of God. God created men. He created women. We've got... We've got our areas that we got to focus on and that there's a massive difference in 
evolution of man versus being created in the image and likeness of a God. Appreciate y'all's patience, y'all's attention. Look forward to, to being with you next Thursday. We're supposed to get two to four inches of snow. So if you see me bundled up, you'll understand what's going on. Take care. Thanks, Brad. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Wayne.